Good morning, everyone. Great to see you all. I'm Janet Lenihan, and I have the privilege of serving as Dean of the Frank G. Zarb School of Business. I would like to welcome you to our event today, the 2020 Long Island Manufacturing Supply Chain Symposium. At Zarb, we place an emphasis on dynamic and well-rounded education for our students. And events like today truly underscore the Zarb experience by bringing top leaders of industry to share their insights and help us understand the complex challenges facing organizations. We all wish we were on campus in our beautiful new building, but one thing these past months have demonstrated is that we can certainly have great conversations virtually through our little Zoom boxes. But you all have an open invitation to tour our facilities once we are able to do so safely. I am confident you will be impressed. Our emphasis on innovation and leadership is showcased throughout our high tech and high touch facility. And it was intentionally designed with Zarb's unique educational features in mind. Offices for faculty and study spaces for students create a working environment that invites collaboration and collegiality. We are the first academic building to include student club space because at SARB, we believe that learning happens both inside and outside of the classroom. And together, those experiences equip our students with the knowledge and skills they need to be successful. Throughout our curriculum, our students are given many opportunities for hands-on learning experiences. Our idea hub is home for the Center for Entrepreneurship, which houses a business incubator for small companies to work right inside our business school building. We also have entrepreneurs and residents who mentor our students as they develop the needed skills to be successful entrepreneurs as well as intrapreneurs. The Behavioral Research and Business Lab similarly provides students the opportunity to use state-of-the-art technology, including eye tracking software, facial analysis technology, voice analysis technology, to study human behavior in organizations. Our students not only learn how this technology impacts organizational decision-making, they actually apply it in organizational consulting projects. For example, last year we had students working with Madison Square Garden, analyzing the digital assets of the New York Knicks and the New York Rangers. And this is just one example of the many ways that we have students engaged in hands-on learning, applying the knowledge they gain in the classroom to real organizational issues. We do the same in our brand new Center for Cybersecurity and Innovation, the only academic war room in New York metropolitan area. The sophisticated technology in the center trains students to detect and defend against cyber crime. And with their hacker attack happening, estimated anyway, happening every 39 seconds, cyber crime is a growing threat for all business organizations. And our Martin B. Greenberg trading room is equipped with 34 Bloomberg terminals, one of the largest and most technically sophisticated academic trading rooms on any college campus. Every ZARB student has the opportunity to earn the Bloomberg Markets Concept Certification, which introduces the financial markets and covers such topics as economic indicators, currency, fixed income, and equity. The trading room designed to replicate a Wall Street trading desk is home to our Student Managed Investment Fund which provides our students the opportunity to manage an investment pool of real money. And I must say they are doing very well, having beaten the market indexes since their inception in December of 2016. And our partnership with IBM provides the opportunity to earn, for our students to earn badges in emerging technology, such as blockchain, artificial intelligence, data sciences, and design system thinking. At ZARB, we prepare our students for the workforce of tomorrow, developing leaders who can thrive in an ever-changing world. And events like today play an important role in their development, helping them discover new areas of interest and gain a better understanding of emerging trends in organizations. As I am sure all of you can attest, there is a tremendous need for talent who understand the, log the role of logistics and supply chain management and our supply chain major gives our students a strong foundation in this growing and high demand field. 
I want to take a moment to thank our co-sponsor, Challenger Motor Freight and Logistics, for their support of our event today. I also want to acknowledge our executive in residence, Mr. John Costanzo, who made this event possible. He has been a tremendous supporter of our school and especially of the supply chain faculty and students. And we can't thank him enough for his leadership in helping build the reputation of our program. Thanks to his efforts, the ZARP School is producing the Long Island Manufacturing Supply Chain Index Survey, a key indicator in the field. And let me now introduce Dr. Kashyap Samgupta, who is not only our Associate Dean of Graduate Programs, he is the Chair of the Management Department, and he is leading our efforts on this important initiative. So welcome, Dr. Samgupta, and thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, Dean Lenahan, for those comments. Um, I think uh, this kind of sets a nice platform for us for this symposium. So what I'm going to do over the next few minutes is to actually present the results, the preliminary results of the survey um, and the, uh, the ensuing supply chain <coughs> index that, uh, that uh, Dean Lenahan was talking about. So just a little bit of a background um, on this is that um, this particular Long Island Manufacturing Supply Chain Index has been published each year, um, used to be actually co-sponsored uh, by Pure Letter International and uh, Stony Brook University. Um, and since starting this year, uh, again, due to the initiatives of Mr. Costanzo, um, we actually, Zarb and Hofstra University have taken this over. And, and essentially we, are administ we, we have administered this version of the survey that just went out and that's what the results we are presenting today. And then of course, uh, going forward, we'll be administering it you know, uh, next year and so on. So, so this is again, a preliminary version of the results because the survey actually is still open for respondents to, um, you know, to report in. So we'll be keeping it open for a few more weeks so that we can get a more comprehensive view of what's going on in the business. So I wanna kind of um, uh, spend a little time on, um, you know, what we're going to cover here, we're covering basically the state of the Long Island manufacturing supply chain in terms of a few different aspects, business trends, customer orders, inventories, workforce, and of course, given all that we are going through this year, uh, some specific ones on COVID-19 implications, because um, that COVID-19 part is new, and there were some great insights from our respondents on how the pandemic actually affected their businesses. So uh, as I mentioned, this it is still open for a few more weeks for uh, additional respondents. In the preliminary survey that we are presenting the results today on, um, we have about 88 respondents. Um, last year in 2019, which was the last version of this survey, uh, the total survey that was reported on had a sample of about 106 respondents. So, so we're pretty close to what last year's sample is as because the survey is still open for a few more weeks, we're expecting a few more responses to come in for our final report on this. Um, just to give you a little bit of demographic on the respondents and the companies, um, as you can see here, a large majority of these businesses have been around for quite a, quite a long time. In fact, it says here prior to 2000, but many of the businesses have been around for almost 30, 40, 50 years actually. So most of them therefore are not new business organizations. They have been in, in, in the space that they are in you know, for a very long time. 90% uh, of the respondents reported annual sales volume at least a million dollars with about 43% reporting between a million and 10 million and about another 47 reporting greater than 10 million. So again, um, a pretty good uh, sample in terms of the, uh, not just the, you know, how long the companies have been in business but also the volume of business. In terms of the employees, as you can see from this graph, um, there is actually, um, you know, a, a pretty good uh, spread in terms of the size of the company in terms of the workforce. Some of them are obviously smaller compared to others, but you can look at the graph and see, well, at least 25 to 49 employees and going beyond that to 50 to 100 and more than 100 actually constitutes a large majority of the sample here. And then the respondents, their profile, um, the final demographic one on this is that uh, most of our respondents on this survey are at a uh, senior executive level. Many of them are at the CXO level. So we're getting um, you know, the responses we got uh, in terms of their insights into some of these questions related to the supply chain. 
uh, does cover, uh, uh, you know, sort of an umbrella kind of a scenario where they're actually looking at the entire organization and responding accordingly. I should tell you also that the um, the demographic of uh, of the sample for this year is actually not much different from what we had in 2019. So it, it's a comparable sample from from last year's survey. Fairly good sense of um, you know industry. Uh, dissemination here. So you can see here, a large group is from the consumer electronics products, aerospace products and parts because it's Long Island, obviously. So there's a large number of businesses focused on that sector. So we did get a, quite a few responses from there. And then the catch-all term of miscellaneous manufacturing, actually almost a, tw uh, a quarter of the total sample was from there. So let me kind of get you um, a little bit into the overall business trends here that um, by the way, the, the questions that were asked actually on the survey talked about specific um, metrics on the supply chain and the business overall. And essentially, uh, there were essentially three responses to each question. One was whether that particular aspect of their business or the supply chain, was it increasing over the last six months? Was it decreasing over the last six months or did it kind of stayed about the same? So most of these data that I'm reporting here today, you can see that there are three levels of reporting to do, whether it increased, whether it decreased, and whether it stayed at, at about the same. And, um, and, it, and it was kind of good to look at this data in a way, just because all of us have gone through this pandemic and still going through it over the last six months to see whether this really affected or has affected any of these businesses or not. And it's encouraging to see in a lot of ways that these metrics kind of sh say that the business at uh, the state of supply chain actually looks pretty good on Long Island. Because, you know, if you look at this particular slide, it says, you know, if you look at production levels, uh, roughly about, by the way, the y-axis here, um, what we're reporting on is the number of responses. So when it says about 50 out of the 88 uh, companies, actually the 88 is the total sample. So not everybody actually responded on each of these metrics. So you can see the total sample here is little less than 80 in some of these metrics here. But even there, if you look at this particular aspect of production levels, as many as 50 of these respondents out of about 74 or so reported that they had actually increased their production levels over the last six months. So that's a very encouraging sign and, um, and that we were expecting some effects of the pandemic to come through in terms of, you know, there being a recession or the business trends going down and those kind of things. These, these data is actually not showing that, it's actually showing the opposite levels here basically. So if you look at the production levels, it has increased. Look at new orders. Again, a majority of them are reporting an increase in new orders over the last six months. A majority of them are actually saying about inventory levels that they've kind of stayed the same. And, um, and you know, as we know, the inventory levels is actually a good metric for how the overall business is doing. When it says the inventory levels are about the same, um, that actually shows a stabilizing factor on the business because if it goes up or goes down, it's very hard to say whether that is going up because your overall business volume is going up or is it, if it's going down, is it going down because you're doing better than what you're doing before? It's a very confusing picture when the inventory levels actually starts going up or down because uh, you have to kind of go back and understand as to what the correlation is with the actual business volume and the trends. But when it stays the same, it kind of tells me at least that um, things have things are going pretty normal in terms of how the last six months have gone for many of these respondents. What is interesting to look at was the air shipments. Um, obviously, because of the pandemic, um, there was a big effect on the uh, you know the air traffic and so on, especially in the first few months in the spring. So we do see a correlation from there that there is a large percentage of the respondents who are reporting that the air shipments actually decreased compared to what they used to have before. But in general, the expected business trends are looking pretty positive here. Let me go into a little bit more detail here. So when I look at um, the top two reasons for increasing production levels, let's say, um, you can see the top two reasons actually in both production levels and for new orders. Uh, the respondents are reporting that it's either due to uh, the business improving general or due to new customers and markets. And of course, the two are sort of tied together, but we deliberately kind of put those two uh, sort of factors in the survey 
because we wanted to check whether, um, of course, new customers is part of the business improvement itself, but um, whether the business improvement itself is also a catch-all kind of a metric, but you're kind of attributing to either the existing customer base or to capturing new customers. And it's encouraging to see that, you know, if you look especially at the new orders, um, a good percentage of the samples respondents are saying that, you know, the overall business improvement has happened because production levels are up um, and have been, you know, increasing generally speaking, but then also some of this is coming from new orders from new customers. So uh, that the, the two together actually tells us a little bit better in terms of the story of what's going on with this business, you know, overall that is on the island. So again, um, very encouraging here to kind of report this. Um, also, if you look at, um, we asked also the respondents as to what's happening to your workforce over the last six months. So about 70 out of the 88 respondents actually reported on this particular question. As you can see from here, um, a very large majority of the respondents, almost three quarters of the respondents is reporting that they have actually hired new employees over the last six months. So that's a very encouraging sign. And remember this is in the manufacturing supply chain space. So we are reporting from that particular aspect across these different industries. So it looks like the manufacturing sector is doing really well in terms of you know, still hiring new people um, through the uh, through this pandemic, basically over the last six months, we also asked as a uh, as a follow up question, what they are expecting to do over the next six months in terms of employee hiring, and we had two questions here. One is overall business, like do they expect more employees to be hired over the next six months, and specifically to their locations on on Long Island as to whether the same trend is going to hold. As you can see, what they're reporting is that. Uh, almost 80 to 85 percent of the respondents are kind of reporting that either they're going to keep the the level of workforce the same as what they are, or actually they're going to increase the workforce level. So, which is again telling us that you know they are they have a very positive view of the business going forward, and only as in a small minority of the businesses are going to are planning for a decrease in the workforce. So that's about employee hiring. Um, we did report on a few other um, supply chain metrics here. Um, you know, one of the things is obviously that um, the prices of the products and the cost that goes into manufacturing the products, where does that come from? Of course, one part of this is the material in a component and the in, uh, in the input pricing from the, that perspective. And, and of course the labor cost and the overhead costs. And we specifically asked about um, what is contributing to the to the prices, and one of them obviously is materials and components. And as you can see, that you know quite a bit of the respondents are re reporting that, generally speaking, the materials and components have increased in prices, basically. So, um, and the order backlog is roughly split up between um, number of people who are responding that order backlog has increased versus staying the same or has decreased. Now, order backlog also is. Um, kind of a confusing term in a way because whether the order backlog actually increases or decreases depends on a number of factors. So, so we did a little bit more digging into this as part of the survey to say, where are these increases or decreases coming from? And so the reasons for change, um, as, you can, as we can see here, basically for the materials and components, a, a good majority of the respondents are responding that the increases are because of the increase in general about on the raw materials and components. So, so that's where the majority of the increases are coming from, which is kind of expected because if a large part of the product that is being made, obviously is uh, you know, sourced from elsewhere and those component pricing uh, levels are going up, then of course it's gonna increase the price of the product itself. So that's kind of expected. In terms of the increases in order backlog, uh, and decreases, um, the increases for people that are reporting increases in order backlog, they're attributing those actually to improvement in the business uh, condition. So going back to the previous part of the survey and the results, this is kind of conforming a little bit as to what's going on at a, at a slightly more level of detail to say, well, a large percentage of the respondents are reporting the order backlog has increased because my volume of business has actually increased, which is actually obviously a very good thing. For folks that reported a decrease in order backlog, um, uh, at least about half of them, this was by the way, a much smaller sample of companies that reported, there was about 10 or 12 respondents who reported a decrease in order backlog. 
and about half of them reported that was due to a worsening business condition. So, um, so it's significant in a way, um, but it's a much smaller sample or a subsample of the overall sample who's reporting um, you know, a decrease and, and a worsening of the business condition. So what we did was we compared, um, so there is a supply chain index that, um, that this survey actually comes out with each year that we do this survey. Um, it's a composite metric of um, you know, looking at the survey responses and seeing uh, what percentage of the respondents are reporting an increase versus staying the same versus a decrease. And we come up with an index. And so here on this particular slide, if you can look at this, the blue bars actually show the index uh, based on this current version of the October version of the survey. And the, uh, the orange graph is obviously from the last version of the survey, which was back in April, 2019. So, so if you look at this particular graph, you'll see that um, actually, and the higher the number, the better it is obviously with the ideal number being a hundred here. So, so uh, whatever you see the blue graph is higher, the blue bar is higher than the orange graph. It means that overall the supply chain is actually doing better uh, in October this year versus April of last year. So, uh, so you can see the production levels, are, the index is slightly up, um, you know, uh, the, uh, the order backlog is slightly up, but some of the other ones are slightly down, but they're not down by that much in terms of, you know, if you look at the overall index for new orders, it is a 76 versus 78. Uh, air shipments is actually, as expected, significantly down. That was kind of expected based on the results of the survey that we got. Uh, and then the number of employees is a little bit down, but not much. So you can see they compare very well in general across the board in terms of how the space is doing compared to what it was, you know, uh, a year and a half back. So again, um, we are reporting this um, today as the preliminary results, obviously. Um, as I mentioned at the very beginning, we're going to uh, continue to have this survey on for the next couple of weeks, and then we'll come back with a full report on this by the end of November, actually. That's the plan. So uh, just to give you a quick summary of this, um, before I get there, let me just go to the COVID effects. Um, one of the things we asked this time, which is new, obviously, is the COVID effects and how it affected the supply chain and their businesses. And uh, we had both positive and negative factors in here for this particular set of the questions. And as you can see, the negatives were um, kind of expected things like there was a reduction in business volume. Um, there were problems receiving supplies in a timely manner. There were disruptions in the shipping and distribution channels. Uh, some of the companies reported the business operations had to be shut down for a period of time. Uh, there was a problem identifying new suppliers, uh, for instance, and you can see there's a fairly good percentage of the respondents who, who reported on some or all of these um, to, that happened. And of course, um, each respondent could respond to multiple of these items. So we actually got a total of from the 88 responses for the overall sample. I think we got about 220 such responses on this particular question. So, so of course, one respondent would be responding to multiple of these factors as to which of these factors affected them. On the positive side, we did see quite a few respondents mentioned that there was an increase in business volume. Uh, actually, some companies reported that they actually did not have a disruption in the supply base. Uh, distribution networks were not affected. And of course, um, the business volume has increased over the last six months. So, um, you could see the negative is a little bit more uh, compared to the positive, which is expected because of what all of us have gone through over the last six months. But overall effects, you know, you're looking at the previous metrics that we just reported shows us that, you know, it's, it's pretty good in terms of the forecast going forward, that is. So coming back to a summary of this largely positive outlook um, on many of these metrics, there's a healthy trend for new employee hires. Uh, we see that there is an increase in the pricing for the products because of the raw materials price increase. Of course, there's a trend in increasing order backlog, mostly due to improvement in business conditions. As we just reported, many companies face negative effects from COVID and a smaller number reported positive COVID effects. So um, as I mentioned, uh, we are expecting more, some more additional responses. Um, we're going to develop and publish the index for, for October. Uh, planning to report and do a distribution of the full report by end of November. And we will likely do a, a spring, um, you know, version of the index in 2021, just because obviously we're expecting things to change a lot or maybe not. We just want to keep a, 
keep an eye out of that. So going out, usually this is a yearly survey, but we may end up doing a spring 2021 version of this just to see how things are moving over the next six months. So um, happy to report this, uh, the preliminary results. And if anybody has questions on this, um, please respond on the on the YouTube live and we'll be able to uh, respond to those questions You know, um, after we're done with the panel discussion. So at this point, I want to um, echo Doc, uh, Jean, uh, Dean Lenahan about what she mentioned about uh, Mr. Costanzo and just to introduce him so that we can go forward into the, into the panel discussion here. So um, uh, John Costanzo actually has been very helpful as, as the Dean was mentioning in terms of helping us with this um, survey that is, and of course, for this particular symposium. Just a little bit about uh, Mr. Costanzo. Uh, he was president of Purulator International for almost 20 years, leading the, you know, um, the subsidiary of the logistics and distribution subsidiary of Purulator Incorporated uh, for almost 18 years. Uh, and currently he's president of LDK Global Logistics, um, which is actually, um, uh, you know, a cross-border uh, logistics distribution uh, agency actually working with one of uh, working with our co-sponsor for this symposium challenger motor freight challenger by the way is uh, one of north america's best and largest full truckload carriers uh, they actually do uh, you know i just got the data from this on on their website actually on the company's website 1500 tractors 3300 tractor trailers and they're doing um, almost 500 to 700 cross border traffic uh, routes basically between US and the Canadian border going both north and south basically. So pretty large um, organization and we're happy that they were co-sponsors for, for our symposium today. Uh, John also is the executive director of Maple Business Council. Um, and uh, Maple Business Council actually is an executive level organization that promotes bilateral investment trade and entrepreneurship between uh, Canada and the US in Southern California and in New York. So, uh, and it, as Dean Lenahan was mentioning, he's also one of our executives in residence in the ZARP school. So, um, so with that said, I want to kind of turn over um, the controls to John and let him take over for the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sengupta. And uh, I thank you and uh, Dean Lenahan for supporting this important uh, research uh, of the supply chain here on Long Island. As you pointed out, it's an important element to the economic health of the region. And these are typically higher paying roles, more stable industries, and uh, really important to the overall health of the economy here. And it's really encouraging to see the positive results uh, that came out in this recent survey. As we all learned too, it's, a, it's an important element in the physical health and well-being of Long Island with the movement of PPE and other critical supplies early on in the pandemic. So very, very important sector and any region uh, requires a strong manufacturing sector in order to be successful. Uh, is, thank you for that introduction. I don't need to do any more. I appreciate it. Uh, uh, very happy to be part of this. As uh, you mentioned, Dr. Sanguta, we, we launched this survey back in 2017, originally uh, with the help of Purolator, uh, but now Hofstra. I'm thrilled that this will be the fifth in a series of uh, surveys of the industry. And the reason we did it is I was appointed to uh, help uh, co-chair a committee for the Empire State Development uh, Agency. And we couldn't find any research or data on the manufacturing sector that was useful on Long Island. So thanks to you uh, at Hofstra for picking up this important research and making sure we understand what's important to our critical manufacturing sector. I also be remiss if I didn't thank several associations for their help in putting this together. The uh, Maple Business Council, the HIA, Hopog Industrial Association will help uh, rally the support of other associations on Long Island to get people to participate in the survey, Ignite, uh, ESD, MTAC over at Stony Brook, US Commercial Service, ADAPT, really great support from the industry and associations that represent this sector on Long Island. So thank you for that. Today, we're honored to have three panelists uh, who understand the importance of supply chain to a region's economic success and are deeply engaged in that whole sector. So let's, uh, let's meet them now. Uh, first, uh, we have Ann Shabunko-Moore. Uh, Ann is the CEO and owner of GSE Dynamics 
a woman-owned small business and U.S. defense manufacturer. They were founded in 1971, and they have two facilities on Long Island, providing complex structural assemblies to the U.S. Air Force, Army, Navy, so forth. They, uh, they uh, and joined GSE uh, in 2001, and has been a strategically grown company, expanding its capabilities since. She also founded Ignite Long Island, a manufacturing consortium uh, and, and an industry-driven association to promote manufacturing or create a, help create a strategic plan, which I believe is badly needed for Long Island for job creation and support for the manufacturing sector. She's won several awards uh, by uh, many, many associations for her support of the business community, particularly here on Long Island. And uh, we are value, we're very, very honored to have her join us uh, this morning. Good morning, Anne. Thank you so much, John. Jim Peoples, uh, after earning a degree in engineering over at uh, what's now is Dalhousie University in Canada, Jim be began his career as a process engineer in the manufacturing industry from Michelin Tire. Over the next 13 years, he held several leadership roles in quality, industrial engineering, and operations management. Following Michigan, uh, Michelin, Jim joined Pure Later Courier, largest small package and freight delivery company in Canada, where over the next 13 years, he served in several senior executive roles in operations, quality, engineering, and, uh, and also technology. He implemented several initiatives of Purolator that improved the service quality and efficiency of the operations. And in 2012, Jim uh, joined Challenger, one of, as uh, Dr. Sengupta said, one of the largest truckload and logistics carriers in North America, where he currently serves as president and CEO. Jim's received many awards uh, in engineering, operations, sales, He's a multidisciplinary leader that gets results, and I can testify to that personally since I worked with Jim over at Pure Later for a number of years. And last but not least is uh, Jim, sorry, good morning. Good morning to you. Thank you, John, for that generous introduction. Michael uh, Lapsinger is the Senior Vice President of New York State's Center for Economic Growth Business Growth Services Unit, BGS, I think its, uh, it's abbreviation is uh, known for. And it's, he's also the regional center director for the Capital Region Manufacturing Extension, Extension Partnership. He directs the BGS team in providing exemplary support to manufacturing and technology companies in growth, operations, sustainability, and business acceleration. He has more than 20 years experience in engineering and product development, manufacturing, business development, and operations, and holds a master's in business administration and a BS in mechanical engineering. He's worked uh, with companies such as Bobcat, Boeing, and Shell Global Solutions. So please join me in also uh, welcoming you, Michael. Good morning. Morning, John. Thank you very much for having me. Okay. Well, thank you, folks. So let's let's uh, jump right into it. And uh, my first question will be to uh, Ann. Ann, uh, you're a you're a fervent advocate of the industry on Long Island, and uh, you started uh, the association called Ignite. Uh, the Manufacturing Consortium. Perhaps you can give us a little insight into what uh, your vision is with that group and, and the importance of that uh, association. Sure, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you to Hofstra and all the leadership involved in this. Uh, John mentioned the need for data. Uh, and actually that's a wonderful entree for me, John, because that was really uh, what made us realize that we needed to have an organization that really does encompass all of manufacturing um, across the entire sector and the different industries that we represent. Uh, so again, thank you to start with uh, sort of leading that and making sure that we do have data that then helps us come up with solutions uh, as a way to improve the status of manufacturing. Uh, so with Ignite Long Island, again, the, the identity of Long Island, uh, as many of you know, was the aerospace and defense industry. Um, but being that Long Island is Long Island made up of tough New Yorkers, uh, we are a resilient uh, region, right? So when aerospace and defense went down regionally here, uh, we were resilient. We came up, we re-identified ourselves, uh, and basically became a supplier of different industries across, again, the entire manufacturing sector. Uh, so we're looking at pharma, nutraceutical, food and beverage, medical devices, electrical supplies. Uh, again, there's a lot of products made here on Long Island. And I realized that there wasn't um, a hub to advocate for these companies. Uh, a lot of good people doing great things. I say that all the time. Uh, our, our initiatives here are amazing as we work with educational institutions and industry. I think we are a very strong region for that. But there was no central hub 
And that was really something coming out of regional council and, and the different leadership um, things here on Long Island, it was apparent uh, that we really needed a trade organization to carry a unified voice and message, uh, not only regionally, but statewide and even national. Uh, there's so many national initiatives going on right now with promoting manufacturing that New York needs to be engaged in. Um, so part of IGNITE is to ensure that we have that regional representation, statewide representation, the national representation uh, to ensure that we're staying ahead of the curve and making sure that we are looked at as having a very strong supply chain. Um, and again, my presence as a defense contractor is actually more on the national level. And I can tell you when I go to national meetings, uh, it is understood that New York is a very unique region with an incredibly strong supply chain. Um, you know, I have that anecdotal that uh, many of you know that I moved one of my companies to Georgia for seven years and moved it back to New York because of the supply chain. The speed in which I can make products here on Long Island was much quicker uh, than that of Georgia just because the ease of transportation and the abundance of supply chain uh, suppliers here. Uh, so that is vital. So, so thank you, John, again, Ignite Long Island, again, encompasses all the voices of manufacturing, no matter what products we make. Um, try to really create a regional plan uh, for how to grow Long Island's manufacturing into the different sectors uh, and really, again, have that unified voice. Uh, and like you said, John, make sure we keep accumulating data because that's what drives, uh, drives the mission here. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ann. Thank you for all your support of the sector here in Long Island. Jim, let's move to you. Uh, Cross-border trade with the United States is a key component in your business. How does the health of the manufacturing sector influence that part of your business? Thanks, John. Great question. Uh, as everybody, I'm sure, knows that U.S. and Canada enjoys the one of the largest trading partnerships in the world. To share some numbers, uh, U.S exports to Canada more than $300 billion a year in goods and services. Similarly, Canada exports to the US more than $300 billion a year in goods and services. Fully one third of those goods and services rely on or come from or originate from the manufacturing sector, both the automotive, uh, machine parts and equipment. And so obviously uh, $200 billion with a trade crossing the border in this sector is very important. The good news for folks in the supply chain and transportation industry is that all of that stuff moves by truck. Certainly we participate pretty heavily in that industry. And as it pertains to my business, 40% of my revenues comes from moving goods in those particular verticals. So yes, John, this is very important to my business. Yeah, thank you, Jim. And, and just for the, those folks on the line, Canada still represents the largest export destination for Long Island based businesses. It is, uh, as Jim pointed out, it's our largest trading partner and it's so, certainly true here on Long Island as well. Thank you. Uh, Michael, uh, you, you lead our region's efforts to study the impact of supply chain for Long Island and uh, support of nearshoring initiatives under the NIST MEP program. Can you please help us to understand the structure of that program and what the specific objectives of these initiatives are and how they can benefit Long Island manufacturers. Sure, thank you. That's a, you know, it, that's good. Good to ask that question because it's a very new program. Um, so, uh, as uh, John mentioned earlier, uh, CG is part of a network of of ten centers in New York that are manufacturing extension partnership centers, and uh, we are funded by the state Empire State Development, NYSTAR. If you're familiar with NYSTAR. That's the, the, the division. And then uh, that money also comes from the National Institutes of Standards and Technology. So NIST, the uh, majority of our funds come from there. Well, they gave out $50 million in uh, CARES funding to centers across the United States. Um, so there's 51 centers, 50 states in Puerto Rico um, that all got some funding. New York got $2.7 million. Our particular initiative, which is led by the Center for Economic Growth, in partnership with uh, MTRC, which is the Manufacturing and Technology Resource Consortium out of Stony Brook. Um, so that's the center in, in Long Island. And then Central North New York TDO, who is in, in, in Syracuse. Uh, CG, we're actually located in the capital region, but uh, 
the uh, the initiative really is is again is similar to to you know understanding of the impacts of COVID on the supply chain and the impacts it's having on our businesses, but also the opportunities that it's presenting them. Uh, so we are also doing a survey, but we're actually not doing a survey blindly. We want the information from the companies. We want to know how they're being impacted because ultimately there are funds to help them take next steps or assess those opportunities or those impacts. So we can help put consultants or, or even in some cases, maybe equipment um, if, if, you know, later down the process to help kind of change or reshore or shore up their supply chain. Uh, the way it really works is initially we want people to fill out a survey. We want to collect data. Um, the more data we get, the better, because that also helps us with the message when we talk to the federal government, we talk to the state government, you know, what, what we need to really make our supply chain strong to make us more competitive, to be purchasing and buying domestically. Um, so the first step is really to do that survey and we'll share that information with you. Um, we'll probably get it out somehow I have to get that out. I'm not sure how John, but uh, um, uh, the website really is, you can find it from um, uh, New York spelled out MEP.com. And then from there, you can get all the deals of the program. But the, uh, um, the next aspect of that is that we're going to do an assessment with you, whether it's an assessment to look at total cost of ownership and understanding what the true costs are from importing a product versus buying it domestically and comparing them kind of apples to apples. Uh, studies have shown that if you're within 10 to 20 percent of an imported cost, you actually can be competitive and can convince someone to purchase domestically. Uh, the other aspect of it, we can look at the, your supply chain risk, you know, really understanding, you know, where am I, where am I getting my supplies at? What are the factors that could impact it? And how do I make up plans so that I'm not chasing around and trying to find new suppliers? We saw that happen in COVID in spades. People were just not prepared. They didn't have backup suppliers. So, you know, we have access to 1300 manufacturing professionals lists and lists of manufacturers around the US, in New York, in Long Island that have the capabilities and we can connect people and help them identify suppliers. So um, yeah, so it, it's a great program. It's really, really new. Um, there's going to be about four, uh, $400,000 initially uh, for projects and assessments for companies. Um, that's going to get spread across New York, but there's also some other initiatives going on at the state level that are talking about at the national federal level. So it's really important that we collect the information and really understand where the issues are. Thank you, Michael. That's great. I, we're going to come back to this a little bit later because uh, it is a very, very important initiative. And uh, I'm really thrilled that you were able to join us to help us understand it better today. Uh, and I'd like to come back to you. Uh, one of the conversations we had recently, you said something that absolutely blew me away. I think you've mentioned that based on uh, what you know and through your association Ignite, there were some eight to 9,000 skilled labor positions in manufacturing that went unfilled in 2019. And that, that, can you give us a little insight into what those positions look like? We have a lot of students on the line today that may be interested in applying for roles and some of them thinking they may have to leave Long Island, but those are pretty high skilled and high paying roles. Uh, maybe you can give us some insight into that. They are, and the, the numbers are real, but of course, I will look to you for uh, making those numbers absolutely backed up by the data. <laughs> so, um, so it is shocking, and it really, it's nothing new either, which is good and bad news. Uh, we've had openings in manufacturing for many, many years. Uh, you know, going back five years, I remember going to Washington and testifying during the jobs bill speech. So that was a while ago. Um, about how this uh, area has a lot of job openings and yet we're having trouble finding the people to fill them. So again, this is uh, good and bad news that this is not a new issue. Um, and what I did not mention with Ignite, of course, is that workforce training uh, and trying to meet the needs of our, of our regional companies is one of the critical initiatives to make sure we can match people with the competency and capabilities to fill these jobs. Uh, so what are these jobs? Um, this is what you and I talk about quite a bit also. Uh, again, this image of manufacturing is a branding uh, issue that this region has to address. Uh, there are jobs across the entire continuum uh, of manufacturing. That's, again, what you and I talk about, John. It's not just the touch labor 
folks who are actually making the products, which is actually an incredibly noble job and something that I'm always very uh, proud of to talk about the people that are actually making these products. But it's really the support of a manufacturing company that I think probably aligns very well with some of the people that are listening here at Hofstra, specifically with your, your cyber and your business and your engineering. Um, these are areas that manufacturing companies continue to need, especially with the technology driven uh, industry that we're in. So, I mean, I'll be real quick in naming uh, some of the things that go it right. You obviously need accounting support, people who understand how to, how to do accounting. HR is a huge thing right now. Again, that's a good thing. Uh, human resources are looking to do a lot of training and trying to attract uh, new people to this business. And also during COVID, we are trying to retrain people, people who maybe lost jobs in other industries, but have competencies that can be cross-trained into manufacturing. Uh, we have, of course, um, my buying activity, my purchasing, uh, material supply people, supply chain management. You have quality control, uh, people that are desperately needed, uh, that understand how to, how to uh, inspect uh, in-process and final goods. Uh, of course, the folks out on the floor who are making them, my methods engineers who tell us how to do it, write out the instructions on how to make a part. Uh, shipping and receiving, again, another very vital uh, position and one that is critical to get the parts out the door and do it the right way so it gets to the, the end user correctly. So it is a broad spectrum uh, of jobs and, and capabilities are required. And um, actually with that, we're working with the Department of Labor uh, through Ignite to really write down what the core competencies are for all of these different jobs to sort of, again, expedite the, the game of matchmaking, industry matchmaking uh, that we do and try and get folks into these jobs quicker. Uh, Cause that's what we, we wanna do. Again, these are jobs to be proud of. Uh, they are good paying jobs. Uh, to, again, I believe they're all above the average salary I believe for the most part. Uh, so again, these are jobs that bring economic impact uh, to the region. We talked about multiplier effects in the manufacturing sector. Uh, these jobs are good paying jobs. They're um, jobs with career development. So there's movement where you can go. You're not stuck in one job forever. There's definitely career development. Uh, so anyone looking for a job in manufacturing, again, there's so much uh, diversified um, positions uh, that folks like myself, and, and I will tell you, maybe we'll talk about this a little later, but most of us did hire as, as the survey supports uh, when we went over those survey results, most of us hired during COVID, which it, to me is one of the most critical messages coming out of your survey, uh, that we were able to hire people and grow and, and improve production during COVID. I think that sends an incredibly strong message um, and a message of hope without sounding you know, emotional about it, <laughs> but it is. I mean, that's, that's a good sign uh, that we're, we're hiring people, we're growing and we're hiring folks. And I hope there are people out there that will uh, touch base with Ignite and we'll put you in touch with companies who are looking for jobs, uh, to fill the jobs rather. Thank you very much. That was an excellent overview. And, and I could mm -hmm. add, I just wanted to mention, uh, just thinking as I was listening to Anne, if you have any questions for Anne or the other panelists, please be sure to enter them into the chat box uh, on, on, your, uh, on the YouTube, I guess, uh, site. And we'll make sure we get to those at the end. And I, I couldn't agree more that there's there's a wide variety. At, at Pure Later, when I was there, we hired quite a few students in the MBA program, actually, from Hofstra for data analytics as well. You know, really understanding uh, the business, right? And where, where we're doing well, where we could do better. And really, as you say, giving us the data we needed to better better manage our business. That's another field if, if uh, students on the line in particular are thinking about a career in that supply chain is definitely a place uh, to, to be. It's a key part of the business. So moving on to that, uh, Jim, um, you know, uh, recently uh, you invested in a state-of-the-art fleet for refrigerated equipment uh, to move pharmaceutical, PPE supplies, and also food distribution. And today with everybody getting everything delivered at their homes, this is becoming an even more critical uh, need with all these companies starting up, uh, preparing foods, preparing dinners while the rest of us are working and helping us to get by the day. Uh, how do you see that becoming a significant part of your business in the future? Well, thanks, John. That's a good question. Uh, our business, uh, we talked about uh, earlier, covers uh, 
a lot of cross border activity. In fact, we have different, uh, different lines of business, 10 in total. And um, in, our, in our business, if you're not, if you're not familiar with the, the supply chain or trucking industry, it's pretty easy to commoditize the services that you would get from a, from a trucking company. A truck is a truck is a truck and a driver is a driver is a driver. Well, in fact, that's not the case. And so in order to differentiate ourselves from lots of other transportation and logistics companies out there, we've created these 10 business units that allow us to focus on the specific niches, the specific demands and capabilities that each of the suppliers in the different verticals require. So as an example, we talked about the automotive business a little bit earlier, and we have a dedicated fleet that focuses on the specific needs in the automotive industry. In this particular case, when it comes to uh, high-end food and pharma and healthcare, the needs of those shippers are again different from many of the other uh, transportation industries. And so as an example, if you're shipping high value pharmaceuticals that need to be temperature controlled crossing the border, you need to have equipment that is capable of, of uh, supplying that service, providing the capabilities that the shipper needs. So we'll have uh, trailers that have been specifically designed. They may have uh, larger levels of insulation. They'll have refrigerated units on the trailers. They'll have temperature tracking within the trailers. They'll have control systems in place. In fact, the shipper can have on their cell phone an application that allows them to monitor the temperature of the shipment as it starts from the originator all the way to the receiver. The drivers are uh, specially trained to handle any and all situations as the shipment uh, transports from the originator to the receiver. And of course, all of that is managed with a uh, highly sophisticated quality management system to ensure that all of the key indicators and processes are followed to the degree that they need to be. As I said earlier, in order to differentiate yourself, uh, you need to have these capabilities that are specific to the industry at hand. We see significant growth in this industry in the future totally emphasized by what has happened through COVID. People are staying at home more, uh, they're ordering in more, they're buying more groceries. Uh, the needs of the aging population require more and more healthcare services. So we see this to be a significant part of the growth in our business and we'll continue to make investments in that area. Today, it represents only a small part of the total revenue in our business. And John, as you know, with a lot of uh, manufacturers and producers of uh, high-end pharmaceuticals in New York, uh, we expect and uh, we'll, we'll see a lot of growth in this part of our business. So we'll continue to invest and grow our business in this area. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. And it's also one of the fastest growing sectors here on Long Island. Pharmaceutical and uh, biomedical research is driving a lot of startup industries and uh, a very, very important sector for the future of Long Island. And that leads me to go to back to Michael to ask uh, about that because uh, the MTAC at Stony Brook has been appointed as the NIST MEP Resource Center. And maybe you can help explain what the nature of their role is that they play and how you work with or through them to, uh, to help uh, incubate these industries and uh, get some money in the hands of people that have uh, an ability to help us uh, build our, our supply chain. Michael, are you still there? Sorry, uh, I was muted. Um, oh, sorry, okay. Yeah, it's actually MTRC. Um, sorry, sorry. The, yeah. At Stony Brook, but uh, that's okay. The um, so like all the centers, all of us have like different roles a little bit at some at some level, and we also leverage each other when needed. Um, the uh, um, oops work. Um, most of us are kind of like boots on the ground in our region, meeting with our manufacturers and really understanding what their capabilities are. So, you know, uh, with, with MTRC, you know, specifically, you know, they have a similar goal in LMEP systems. They want to help businesses generate new sales or find new markets, improve on their operations, make them more efficient, you know, kind of call that operational excellence, continuous improvement, lean things like that, um, and then supporting innovation and growth. So not only the startup companies, but also how do we bring innovation technologies and things into um, 
into the actual businesses. You know, we still struggle with this aspect of, you know, they're actually at a university, they do a lot of research and they kind of have a research agenda, but some of us aren't associated with universities and we kind of have this back and forth about like, well, there's good existing technology out there commercially ready, we can put in place while the university system tends to want to like try something new. Uh, but there's a balance of that. You see some companies that are very willing to do things that are new and those that are not. So we try to balance that that aspect as well, you know, just to give you a little bit more detail on the types of things, you know, we have tools like tech technology driven market intelligence that that can be used or tech scouting. And those are two tools to like, how do we really go in and assess a new market and understand it? Or we're looking for a technical solution to a problem that we're having within our in our operations or in our process. You know, is there something out there that could give us an advantage? Um, there's growth services, strategy type things, sales training. I mean, it covers a gamut of a lot of different things. Um, but the biggest area I think where we play is really in operations um, and sta uh, standards like ISO. Uh, we have a lot of uh, resources to help people become um, ISO certified. Uh, as you're starting to compete more within, especially reshoring, and you want to compete with, you know, uh, across the world. ISO becomes a very important thing. Um, you know, AS9100, you know, and I'm sure you are very familiar with that. Uh, you know, those things are important for you to compete and you need to understand it, where they are, where you play a role in that supply chain. You know, are, are you a tier one, a tier two, a tier three, serving an OEM? What do they need from you? It's a lot of it's relationship building and really understanding where you fit, where your gaps are at, where your risks are at. So, you know, in this context, that that's really what the MEP network wants to do is help you understand where you fit and whether there is a good opportunity for you or not. But you have to be willing to invest in it too. So, you know, some businesses are happy with where they're at. They they're don't want to grow any further. So, you know, how can we just help them simply improve their operations? So. Thank you, Michael. Appreciate that. Good overview. You know, I, I, I want to go back to Anne, and uh, Anne talked about the importance of the uh, manufacturing sector for the economy here in Long Island. And, you know, it just it strikes me as I listen to everybody, you know, Long Island has a reputation for being a bedroom community, kind of highly dependent on New York City. And that's, that's true. There's a strong relationship uh, in the economy of Long Island and New York. However, what's not known is this whole manufacturing sector is not only supplying the needs of 3 million people here in Long Island, but exporting billions of dollars of, te of material, technology, equipment, aerospace uh, parts and, uh, and equipment uh, around the world, right? It's a, it's a huge economic force, this sector. And while there are some problems and challenges for sure, I think understanding those challenges and supporting this critical industry are gonna be important to the future of Long Island in, in the decades to come. So Anne, back to you. Uh, how well, in your mind, does the survey reflect your company's experience? For instance, do new orders production six months out look positive for GSE Dynamics? I think, again, I'm in a very unique um, place to answer that question because I was essential. I was a critical infrastructure industry as part of the defense industry. Uh, so we actually didn't miss a day during COVID. We were open the entire time. Uh, so again, I think it's critical when you look at data to uh, make sure you look at these variables, right? So, so as a defense contractor, I can tell you um, that I'm pretty in line with the results, which I guess is a good thing, right? So production was up, sales were up. Uh, I actually got contracts all through COVID. Um, based on the government fiscal year, I will tell you that September is usually slow uh, as it gears up for that October 1 release. Uh, but again, October caught up for whatever we didn't get in September. So and then the other, as I mentioned, which has been critical, I think I want to say between five and 10% increase in um, our employment numbers. So we were able to look at the pool of candidates out there. Uh, unfortunately, people lost jobs, but we were able to scoop them up pretty quickly. So and again, based on the data, that looks like uh, what others were able to do, uh, which is a good thing. So people weren't out of work too long. So, so I'm happy to report um, that personally for me, um, we're pretty in line that everything was up, which again, yeah. which is not what you would think, right? <laughs> yeah. um, well, but then, I think it's a, it's a testament to the region, right? I mean, we respond, manufacturers respond. 
you know, people responded quickly to what Long Islanders needed. Uh, so I'm, I'm happy that the data is showing that we all were uh, not just sustaining, but we're actually able to thrive, which sounds very odd to say that during COVID, but <laughs> well, yes, I we were I appreciate your modesty, but you guys have been doing this for 40 plus years. So I have a feeling the quality of the production you produce is, uh, is also part of wow. that equation. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Jim, Strong we had nature. a question. <laughs> okay. Jim, we had a question come in uh, for you that I think uh, would be a good one to address now if we could. And that is, how do you, how do you see the importance of uh, alternative fuel vehicles or what is their importance in the future of trucking? Yeah, that's a great question. There's been an awful lot of research over the years on uh, alternative sources of energy to drive trucks. And at some point in the future, there will be a solution that works for everybody. Today, um, I will say that the search for alternative fuels is still in its infancy. We will uh, read about and hear about on the news that uh, lots of companies are pursuing uh, electric powered vehicles. Uh, we'll see and read about uh, companies that are trying hydrogen powered vehicles. Uh, similarly for uh, liquefied natural gas or compressed natural gas. And personally, um, we aren't, my company isn't in the research business. Uh, like a lot of the companies that you'll hear on the news. So we'll be, we'll be a fast follower for uh, the first type of solution that comes to market. Um, there are a lot of companies out there that have tried uh, liquefied natural gas and compressed natural gas and made significant investments over the last few years. And I will say that uh, the technology is changing so quickly that it's careful, you know, be careful not to invest too much money in a particular solution at this point in time until the solution becomes more developed. My opinion is that there is a fairly long transition from the existing fossil fuel sources to the new technology. Uh, in, in my particular case, uh, the trucking business, uh, our trucks are powered by diesel fuel as most people probably know. Uh, the long-term solution is that they will be powered by uh, batteries uh, and or hydrogen. But I think we're a number of years away from having a solution that satisfies all the needs of the industry. As an example, uh, today there are battery powered trucks. Um, those trucks can probably drive within, uh, I'll be careful to convert my metric to, to uh, English system here, uh, convert, uh, 150 kilometers or call it a hundred mile range before they need to go back to their terminal. The capacity of those batteries then requires them to be charged for three or four or five or six hours. So if you know anything about the trucking industry, and I said earlier in my comments that the average length of haul for a, for a truck in my fleet is almost 500 miles, there's no way that the existing technology, the battery power technology would allow us to deliver those loads. But there is an application for that technology for local deliveries and local pickups uh, within that range, you certainly can use that technology. And there is uh, billions of dollars being spent on developing better technologies for the batteries and better technologies for the trucks. Speaking specifically about batteries, but there, is, uh, there are other efforts with hydrogen as well. And as each of those uh, technology gets developed, I believe there will be a final solution. My bet uh, is going to be on electricity and diesel for the short term. Uh, and the longer term will be a combination of electricity, uh, hydrogen, and possibly diesel for certain applications. Great insight. Thank you for that, Jim. Uh, you know, I wanted to just mention too, uh, for those of you that are not aware of this, we have one of uh, the 10 uh, national labs for the Department of Energy right here in Long Island called Brookhaven National Labs. And one of their major focus areas is on developing uh, sustainable energy uh, batteries that can be built into the vehicles you mentioned uh, and uh, change, change the whole dynamic in the future, but they haven't gotten there yet. They haven't found anything that packs as much power as a, an ounce of fuel does, but, but they're working hard on it and eventually they'll, they'll find a solution. But it, it's important to know that we are doing that right here on Long Island uh, in, uh, in Brookhaven National Labs and uh, part of that solution in the future. 
Thank you, Jim. So uh, I go back to uh, to uh, Anne for a moment. Uh, you know, you mentioned, I, I think in, in Ignite, you mentioned there are 12 sectors that you focus in on. Can you give us an idea of, or an overview of what sectors you think are the most important for uh, the manufacturing sector here on the island? Mm -hmm. I think they're all important, uh, which is an easy answer to tell you, right? Because uh, what we learned with aerospace and defense, of course, was that when, when Grumman left back a very long time ago, um, we had to recover. So I think that taught us a lesson learned that you can't really put all your eggs in the one um, sector specifically of A and D. Um, so that being said, uh, I will answer your question more specifically. I definitely think as a region, again, we have to be strategic. I think we have to pick four or five of the top ones that we really wanna be vested in. Uh, and, and much like you said, our development and our research drives some of that natural um, evolution of which ones we're gonna focus on. Uh, so the pharmaceutical, I think, uh, I can't remember who it was Jim or Mike, Michael, I think mentioned the pharma. Um, the pharmaceuticals and nutraceuticals has been amazing. The growth in that area very specifically is clearly going to be a, a critical economic driver for our manufacturing sector. Uh, and actually agriculture and food and wine, that is actually, right, that goes back into Long Island manufacturing history well before anything else. Uh, so I think uh, 1920s, 1930s, agriculture, manufacturing around food was a primary thing. Uh, so I like to say that we've continued that and grown with that. So food and wine and, and beverage has to be one of the top ones there too. Um, and then I like in the survey, we throw miscellaneous in there, right? So <laughs> uh, that's when yeah. I think that, you know, all other things, uh, obviously Diodario is a, a large company here. Uh, we have other, you know, even the Canon and Estee Lauder. Um, those are those are companies that are important to focus on as anchor companies. Um, you know, Estee. I mean, sometimes I don't even think people realize the brand names that we have located here on Long Island. But those are companies that we really have to make sure are engaged in in the messaging. Uh, like events like this to make sure we focus. Um, so those are just few. But again. Um, to me, it's it's the whole entire group that we have to look at, and again, brand us as an entire manufacturing region, not as an aerospace and defense, not as a pharma, not as a medical device, but as a manufacturing region, yeah. um, because that's where we that's what we are, and and we have to continue to make stuff that we that we New Yorkers need. So, it's across the board, John. Thank you, thank you for that. I appreciate it, and I, I couldn't agree more. We need a strategy here that focuses on those sectors that we think are going to give us the best return on that investment over the next exactly. uh, decade or so. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a question that came up, which is a really good one, actually, and, and I'm going to throw it out to all the panelists. I think it's probably the last one we have time for this morning, uh, and then we'll close out uh, with Dr. Sengupta. But um, how, do, how does blockchain fit into what you're doing in your business, uh, or in the case of the state, how does that fit? overall into your strategy. Uh, can I start, John? Sure, absolutely. Uh, that, that, that's a great question. And it's something that uh, we've been thinking about for a long time. As, as you know, uh, part, of my, uh, part of my experience in business has been in manufacturing. Uh, part of it has been in final mile delivery. And now part of it is in uh, transportation. And I will tell you that supply chains are incredibly convoluted. We have a collection of businesses that focus on suboptimizing supply chain, and I don't mean it in a malicious way. Uh, each of the businesses are responsible for uh, being successful in their own right. And so they tend to focus on the effectiveness and the efficiency of their own business. And whatever inefficiencies that they generate, they pass along to the next company in the supply chain. And that continues from the beginning where the raw materials are taken out of the earth or wherever we get them from, uh, through the uh, refining process, uh, through the manufacturing process, through the packaging process, through the transportation process, right through to the final mile delivery process. The supply chain has, has an incredible amount of inefficiencies. So the dream state in my mind is that imagine uh, a world where the data is available uh, for, for each of those businesses in the supply chain 
And the end result was focusing on the effectiveness of the, into the total or the entire supply chain and not uh, the individual businesses in the supply chain. Well, that's a significant uh, paradigm shift that people would need to undergo. But that's the, that's the dream that, that I have, uh, especially about improving the efficiencies in supply chain. And I believe blockchain is a key to making that happen. So in fact, uh, we have an initiative on a very small scale uh, trying to get cooperation between uh, some of my shippers and some of my receivers incorporating my own processes with complete data sharing transparency so that we can optimize the processes of all three uh, organizations in the supply chain. I believe that the blockchain is the future to help us do that on a larger scale. We need uh, a committee, uh, an industry, uh, some of the things that maybe Ann talked about and some of the things you talked about, John, uh, partnerships in industry to ensure that we can improve supply chain and make it much more effective and much more efficient. So that would be my high level comment, John. Thank you, thank you. Uh, before we move to the next question, did anybody else want to weigh in on that or? Okay. Thank you, Jim. I know it's going to be critical. It's kind of hard to understand what blockchain is for a lot of people. And uh, it's a funny story. One of my operations managers is very technically savvy. Couldn't understand. He went and bought a book about it, read it, finished it, and said, I still don't understand it. <laughs> right? So <laughs> it's a challenging uh, concept, but it is going to be, uh, particularly in the movement of, as you said, food, pharmaceuticals, I think going to be a critical uh, element to uh, transport in the future. Uh, there was one more question that came in, I think we have time to address, and that's on the, the nature of air shipments. Dr. Kaushik, the study showed that uh, use of air shipments has actually gone down during the pandemic. Uh, do you have any insights to add there or comments that you'd like to make about that? No, I think uh, that was actually interesting, but not totally surprising, I think, uh, given what we have gone through in the last six months, right? I mean, air cargo has been down. I mean, uh, there have been severe restrictions on that. Actually, I, I was curious about that to our panelists to kind of ask them about this part of it, because as we know, the economics of air shipments is very different from doing it on trucking because the cost is so much higher. You can't transport that much of a volume. So yeah. I guess it's a question for Jim, maybe more, and, and also for Anne as to what are you seeing there? Like, is this going to continue assuming that air shipments are not going to come back to the normal pattern for a while? And you have the capacity issue on the trucking side that you mentioned, Jim. Um, how do you really tackle that? Because um, you don't have drivers that you need and you don't have the trucks to go to immediately on a short notice. So, and it's a problem for the industry in general, right? So would it become a point? I don't know whether it's at a point or would it become a certain at some point where you figure out that this is the amount of capacity I have and that's how much I can handle and you're leaving stuff out because you can't, you just don't have the drivers and the trucks and you don't have the air shipments also to kind of back it up on. So where do you think that is going in terms of how that sector would play out? Uh, I can start if, if that's okay. Um, I think it's a long answer. Um, it really is a, a basic supply and demand uh, equation that uh, shippers have goods to move from one part of the country or the world uh, to another. And uh, there are a limited number of choices and a limited amount of capacity to make that happen. Uh, today, uh, a lot of the air shipments have, have gone away, primarily due to international shipments. Um, and the really, the issue is that the cost of moving shipments by air is very, very expensive. It can cost tens of thousands of dollars an hour to fly an airplane. And unless that plane is fully utilized, uh, going in both directions, the cost for putting shipments on that plane will be exorbitant and, and shippers will not want to pay those fees uh, for moving those goods. At the end of the day, um, the consumers have to pay for those goods. They have to pay for all of the costs that went into getting the goods uh, manufactured and delivered and, and to their front door. And unless the consumer is prepared to pay for those things, those activities will not return. Um, we are in a transition today where the overall shipping capacity has been reduced for lots of reasons. Part of it is that there are fewer truck drivers on the road today uh, because they are getting uh, you know, uh, uh, wage subsidy payments or 
they're concerned for uh, health issues uh, or they've retired or there aren't enough uh, new drivers coming into the industry. And at some point when consumers aren't able to receive the goods as they have expected, and we've created an unreasonable expectation, I believe, in the last little while, uh, where you can sit at home and, uh, and order a book online and have it delivered to your door probably faster than you could go to the local uh, Starbucks store or chapter store or Barnes and Noble store and bring it back home again. So we've created an expectation and I think uh, it'll stay the same status quo until those services aren't be able to be delivered as, as consumers expect. Um, in, in my particular case, we have a lot of trucks on the road, as you heard John mention at the beginning of this session. Uh, some of our trucks are driven by a single driver, and in the United States, they're allowed to drive for 11 hours in a, in a single day, a single 24-hour period. Some of our trucks have two drivers. That means we can drive 22 hours in a single day and get a much further distance in much less time. That enables us to provide expedite shipping services uh, to ground transportation shippers. But in no way does that solve the problem of um, uh, shipping goods that, that are outside that range of capability. So I believe it's going to depend on consumer demand and their willingness to pay for the services before it will change again. Yeah, Jim, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And, and uh, you know, air freight, uh, I'm sure Anne might, you know, mention this as well. It's a very expensive proposition and uh, it's never going to be more than five, 10 percent of a, of a supply chain budget, right, or logistics budget because of that. Where I've seen it in my experience in logistics, where I've seen a spike in the use of air shipments is uh, just before recovery. So I wouldn't be surprised in the next survey, Kaushik, that we do, uh, we're not going to see an increase in air. And the reason for that is twofold. One is uh, that people, the manufacturers like uh, Ann are not going to want to increase production unless they're getting the orders in, right? They're very hesitant. And even when the orders start increasing, uh, they're still going to be hesitant that they may not be sustained. So it's less expensive to ship things by air and, and have less production than it is to increase production and be stuck with a whole bunch of inventory on your books. So that's where I think you typically see an increase in air, air usage, but it'll always go back right away, as Jim was saying, to ground. Ground is always going to be the major transportation uh, source for the, for the Americas, for sure. The other way you see it is when companies are looking to reduce their inventory holdings, like say in Canada or in reverse in the United States, a Canadian company wants to reduce the inventory they're holding down here. They'll bring that inventory back into their home country and use air to a, to a little more of a degree to get shipments in there quicker on, on uh, urgent or fast moving product. So uh, I, I'm not surprised to see it's down because uh, Orders are flowing in on Long Island, and uh, there's really no need right now to uh, do that. But as production increases, I think uh, decisions, and maybe you can right weigh on this, decisions about use of air might, might weigh a bigger factor in your thinking. Uh, actually, I don't have a lot to add to this topic. I, mean, I do mostly ground transport unless there's urgency. Uh, warfighter needs something. Obviously, and the government dictates that it's going to be air. Um, but I, I was laughing. We. I was thinking logistics, logistics, and of course you just mentioned logistics. I didn't mention that as a great job, but uh, <laughs> and planning, right? it comes down to logistics and planning and looking at um, business impact on that one. But uh, I agree with what you said in terms of the ground transport. Yeah, yeah. and so, I guess the last thing you want to do is be stuck with additional inventory that you're not going to be able to, to market, right, or right. sell. Although in your business, that's probably less likely. It's all contracted. But in any event, thank you for that. Yep, anybody else? Uh, hey. John, I wouldn't mind adding a little something there, and it's more yeah, on the sure. people side of supply chain because, um, you know, we've seen impacts on travel for people who are used to going to their suppliers or even their customer to inspect or look at parts and quality. And manufacturers have to consider that their employees have a level of, of risk of flying on aircraft and traveling to places. There's restrictions. New York doesn't you let you go anywhere and come back. It's just, it's really difficult. That can have an impact on your supply chain because then you're going to get bad quality parts. How do you deal with that? Like you got to have a plan on how to make sure you ensure that you're getting good supply. So, you know, it's not just 
product, it's people as well. Great point. Great point, Michael. And thank you. Good, uh, good ending, I think, to our Q&A session today. And uh, if we didn't get to your questions, I promise you uh, we'll get to you after, uh, after the uh, webinar today. Uh, I'd like to now turn it back over. Well, first, before I turn it back over, I want to thank our panelists for doing an outstanding job of providing insight and shedding light on this very critical part of the Long Island economy. So thank you. And I, I can't say enough uh, for the insights that you provided us today. Uh, Dr. Sengupta, I'd like to turn it back over to you to sure. close out. So uh, thank you again. Thank you to all the panelists uh, and to John you for holding this and coordinating all the efforts to uh, get our three uh, eminent panelists on this particular symposium. I think, uh, as Dean Lenahan was mentioning before, we would have liked to have done this in person, obviously. It could have been a bigger event in a way, and I think we'll end up doing something like that next year when we're able to. But I think uh, in terms of the messaging to our participants and attendees, and especially the students, uh, you know, that is not much different whether you do it virtually like this versus doing it in person. So one of the things I would want to kind of ask maybe one more question to the panelists before we end here is that, and maybe you can kind of let us know off, offline also later on when you give some thoughts to it is to, um, and I think Anne, you kind of mentioned that you did respond. You were one of the response uh, responses to the survey actually. So would would we do something different with the survey next time we do this? Um, do you want to add some aspects to this that was not captured in the preliminary results? Because although I did present the preliminary results, um, it's preliminary from the perspective of we haven't closed it out completely yet and we may get some few responses. In terms of the scope of the survey, whatever I presented today was, was basically what is there in the survey, except for some qualitative comments at the end, which we have a pretty long list of that. We're gonna put that in the full report, but is there any part that was missing in the survey that you want to add in the next version? I'm just curious about that. I, I think the one thing that stood out, and again, it's in terms of alignment, right? So I have to say, Hofstra, you have become such a leader uh, in manufacturing support, and I appreciate what you've done through business and engineering and also the co-op program that you have at Hofstra. Um, so that being said, I, I see the alignment with Hofstra often. And one of the things that I think is gonna be critical to make sure that we're kind of singing from the same hymn book here is when John and I are talking about the different industry sectors within manufacturing, I think the survey should actually ask that specific question, you know, and, and which you do, I mean, in terms of A and D, but maybe make sure that our categories are the same categories that you're using um, so that we can talk to the same data and talk to the same messaging and we can see the trends happening in pharma and in A and D and in the different agriculture businesses. And uh, that way we can come up with better conclusions together uh, to look at the, the initiatives moving forward. Um, but again, as far, I mean, again, offline, I would obviously love, I think we're gonna continue to work together, make sure that we are aligned in the messaging and the strategic plan. That's so great. That's what I, I would do, just dig a little deeper into the individuals. Yeah, and I think we have to go back and that's where the, I think that's a good point, and that uh, in the main report, um, we're going to do the sector-based kind of analysis there to see if there's any uh, any differences in the results across the sectors. Right. Which and, um, and yeah. The other, I'm sorry, um, I didn't mention the numbers, um, and I think you and I talk about this and the challenge to get responses to get a significant end right in statistics. Uh, I would like to see that number higher, and mm -hmm. I. Think again, as partners together, uh, not just us, but all the partners that support manufacturing, uh, with 2,600 manufacturing companies on Long Island, we should be able to push your response rate much higher, I think, if, if we, uh, again, as a region, understand the importance of, of what you're doing. So it's going to be an important goal. Yeah, and I was, I've was i been talking with John on that part of it also to see how do we get more responses on the survey? Because as you said, Anne, that we have more than 2,500 companies on the island who can respond potentially. So yes. only still capturing a very, very small percentage of that whole sample, our whole population that is. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So whatever efforts you can help us to disseminate this. And I think, John, your efforts to outreach uh, to these trade organizations and some of the other associations have really helped, but I think we need to put, and, you know, we have to figure out what is the best way of doing this, you know, and more most effective way to do it. Yeah. That's an ongoing process. Yeah. Yep. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. 
great. So I want to kind of, uh, we're almost at 11.30. I don't want to keep everybody waiting until bef beyond the uh, scheduled time here. So I just want to thank everybody again uh, for joining us. Thank you for all the attendees for joining us today. I hope this was useful to all of you. And we are all available, obviously. So if you have any questions, as John was mentioning, after the webinar is over, please let us know and we'll be happy to answer them. John, do you have anything else to add? No, I just want to thank you again. Thank everybody for joining today. And uh, just think manufacturing. It's a critical part of our, uh, of our economy. Yep, great. Thank you very much, everybody. I hope you have a nice rest of the day and, and have a great one. Thank you. Thank Good you. Day, everybody. Thanks. Bye-bye. Okay.